Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, so given that I've seen a whole bunch of people trying to play with deep networks, and not just in the room, but probably also the people who are still asleep and will be watching the video in a few hours or maybe tomorrow, a quick public service announcement. Um, don't use MATLAB. Um, don't try implementing a deep networks library from scratch unless you have a very, very, very specific reason why you absolutely have to do that. Um, instead, there's a couple of pretty good libraries out there that you should look at. And um, let me go through them in, well, some arbitrary order. Um, so the first one is called Torch. So, to okay, sorry. Uh, well, okay, let me try black. Maybe black works. Okay, good. So Torch is good if you like to write in some weird Lisp-like version called Lua. This is the language in which you specify the models. And it's a fairly integrated way. Um, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of it, but there's a lot of actually use of that in industry. Um, so you should use Torch, and you should use all the Facebook extensions to Torch if you want to use that. Um, the next one is called Theano. Um, this is essentially a University of Montreal thing. It's a compiler, and you first specify things in a Python-like framework, and then you compile it down, and it's supposed to be good, except that it's not quite that fast. So Torch is faster, quite a bit faster, so I'm not sure I would recommend it, but the basic idea, I think, is very neat. Um, then there's something called Cafe. NVIDIA likes that a lot. This is basically out of UC Berkeley. If you're looking at convolutional networks, um, this is a pretty good library. Um, it does multi-GPU. It doesn't do multi-machine. Actually, none of them does. Um, so this is essentially C++, and you can specify layers. It's actually a pretty nice library. OK? Um, then. There is something called Minerva. Which I think is actually one of the nicest ones right now out there. Um, it's still a little bit early quality, but it's a very, very good team out of Shanghai that's working on this. Um, you program either in C++ or Python. I think they're pushing more their Python interface. In spirit, it's a little bit closer to Theano, except that it's way faster. A um, couple of other things. If you do deep networks, you do need to have a GPU. right? Um, so if you are planning on doing deep networks and you don't have a GPU, um, you should talk to your friendly advisor and ask them, hey, can you buy me one? So the one you should be asking for is something like a GTX 970. And you probably better ask for an additional power supply for that too. So you'll need at least an extra 150 watts to 200 watts for the power supply for the 970. It costs around $350, and it will probably do for the model that you're going to work on in class. If you're really, really poor, and you don't like to play computer games or whatever after that, um, you could look, maybe make do with a GTX 750. And that costs around $150, and you will not need a big power supply. Um, the 750 is, well, maybe about between half and 2 thirds the speed, but the catch is it has less memory. By the way, you should also realize that all of those are mostly decent for single precision, double precision, well, good luck. If you absolutely must have double precision, you should probably go and use something called G2 
dot 2x large, which is an Amazon instance. And so it's basically, so Amazon lets you use GPUs. Those things are extremely expensive by the hour, as in we're talking like $2 or so, uh, or maybe a dollar. I forgot the, ex the exact numbers, but it's kind of on the pricey side. However, if you go and book it as a spot instance, you will get that for pennies. You'll probably get it for about six, seven cents an hour. If you don't know what Amazon spot instances are, now is a really good time to learn about how they work. Okay. Um, so there are plenty of tutorials on how to use them online. Read them up. The other thing is Amazon will give you about, I think, $100 of free compute time. You can get more free compute time on Google and Microsoft, but they don't have GPUs, so it's kind of not so useful for you. Okay. Of course, you can also shop around and find out whether somebody else in your lab is doing deep networks, and you can then go and use their hardware and their infrastructure. If you're utterly desperate, talk to me. We have stuff, uh, but that's stuff for my students, and they're actually pretty much hammering the machines anyway. So if I give you access, that means that yeah, my students will have less access to it, right? So if you're desperate, talk to me. Other than that, you should talk to your advisor first and you should try getting this. Um, the other thing that you could do, and it may be a little bit late, but you could send a nice and friendly letter to NVIDIA. And you tell them, well, look, I'm working on such and such a problem, and GPUs are really awesome. Would you please send me a K40? And if you write a really nice letter, they will actually send it to you. Uh, the catch is that you'll probably need a decent machine to put it in, right? So you need proper power supplies and all that. Again, if you're stuck there, talk to me. Maybe something can be arranged. The problem is this has a lead time of up to a month. So it may not be in time for your project. Whereas if you order stuff on Newegg, it'll probably show up in about three, four days. If you need computer cases with a 450 watts power supply such that you can drive one GPU, I have spare ones up in my lab you can grab one, as you can grab it and keep it. Okay. <coughs> Good. So that's as far as deep networks are concerned. Um, make sure you got your hardware sorted out immediately. Don't write the stuff on your own in MATLAB unless you are in it for the learning experience of writing this all from scratch. It's painful, so don't. Okay. Any questions on that so far? We'll be doing deep networks later in this class, just not right now yet. Okay. Good. Well, then we can wrap up uh, Gaussian processes by looking at Gaussian process classification. And yeah, then we'll finish. Okay, and then we're on to graphical models. Okay. So, sorry. Was there any question? No question? OK, good. So as a matter of fact, here we already have our first graphical model. So if you recall in regression, what we did is we assumed that our data was given by a normal distribution conditioned on the observations x. And then the, so that this was, these were these variables t. And then given those variable t, we would add some noise and we'd get the y's. And basically what we would do is we would make this assumption here on a link between the y's and the t's. Now, that's very nice if I have real value data, but it may not work so well for binary classification, so I need a different link. And basically what I need to do is I need to turn my information about the value of t into something about you know, whether this is, let's say, class 1 or class minus 1. OK, so here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to assume that t is drawn from a normal distribution, as you would. 
So standard Gaussian process with some mean mu and covariance kernel k. But now each of the y's is given by a logistic link function. Right? So this is basically just the 1 over 1 plus e to the minus y times t. We actually saw this thing before when we did exponential families when we looked at you know, just the distribution over two different outcomes where we had our natural parameter being t, which then governed, you know, how high the probability was for a particular event. Okay. So just as a refresher, if you don't recall it, this is the logistic function. And, well, it's kind of barely visible, so let me just redraw it. Okay. Now, this function here has a value of one half at zero. And while the larger t is, the more, you know, well, the closer to one it gets. Well, of course, it shouldn't exceed one because otherwise it's not a probability, so it will go to one and minus one respectively. Okay, um, so this is the logistic function. And it allows us to map things like the probability that I have a one or a minus one into a score that is a real valued number. So I can either treat it just as that or I can actually try to go for the exponential family's meaning behind that and it doesn't really matter. So that's just a refresher of what we had before. And here's our logistic function. OK. So in regression, the really nice thing was that we could actually integrate our things. right? So what we had is we assumed that t was drawn from a normal distribution. And that the y's condition on the t's were also drawn from a normal distribution. So everything you know, matched up very nicely. And I could jointly integrate everything out. And everything was good. Right? So that's basically what gave me this extremely simple estimation process. Um, for classification, of course, that doesn't work. Because, well, you, know, you can't quite so easily solve that integral you would have to go and integrate over t in order to get the y's. So all we can do is we can just look at a posterior distribution. So what we know is, just by Bayes' rule, we can get that p of t given y and x. It's just p of t given x. This is from our Gaussian process. And then we have all the p of yi given ti's. So that's basically what we have from our logistic link function. And, well, just spelling terms out, you get the last line here. Okay. So that's p of t given x and y. And what I can then do is I can just go and maximize, for instance, to find the mode of p of t given x and y. Quick question. Why is mode finding here not such a terrible idea? Yes? It's an optimization problem where you find maximum. Yes, so mode finding is a maximization problem, yes. But mode finding can go horribly wrong if OK, let's say, for instance, I have a distribution over genders and I have, well, two modes. I have male and female. And the average between that is neutral. And, well, neutral isn't a particularly representative sample from my population, right? So that's an example where mode finding can go horribly wrong, right? Because neither of those two modes will terribly well tell you much about the average. On the other hand, the average will not tell you terribly much about the modes. However, what we can immediately see is that both of these arguments are convex, well, are log concave. In other words, the negative logarithm of this is a convex function. 
because one is basically one half t transpose k inverse t, t, and the other one is basically the sum over the logs of 1 plus e to the minus y times t. And since it's a convex minimization problem, I know that it has one global minimum. And so therefore, I know the problem has a unique mode. And furthermore, you can actually show with a little bit of more algebra that things concentrate very nicely around the mode. In other words, the mode is unique, and it is typical. And in that case, mode finding is a pretty good approximation for solving an integral. Let me quickly draw a picture, because this might bear repeating. Uh, they are uploaded. They, they, they should all be on the website. For which class? For this. For this one. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me fix that. But the previous ones are all there. Yeah. Up until math. Okay. Good. We'll upload them. Yep. Uh, focus. Sorry. This would usually autofocus and Yay. There we go. Okay, good. So this is just a really, really simple thing, right? So if this is our probability you know, it's our axis X, and here's the probability distribution. Right. Sorry, my pen doesn't write any better than that. Then, of course, if I have that, the mode's going to be, you know, maybe it's going to be this one here. It has a secondary mode here, but the mean will be there, which has very little to do with either of those modes, right? So mode finding is a terrible idea in this case. It doesn't work. Um, so what you should do instead is you should actually draw from that probability distribution, and then you'll get the whole bunch of samples here, and the whole bunch of samples there, and this will tell you something about the question that you're trying to answer. On the other hand, if I have this situation, um, then well, OK, it does look like a Gaussian. I didn't intend it to be one. But here, the mode and the mean may be fairly close. They need not be identical, but they're going to be close. And so replacing the mode, basically the integral, the p of theta given data times f of theta by a f of theta max is going to be a pretty good approximation. Because if you think about it, this is our parameter theta. And this, this distribution is basically what we think about this parameter to be given the data. So for instance, let's assume that, OK, let's, let's pick a a realistic example. Let's say I want to infer something about the voltage of an electric socket here in this room. Then what I could do is I could go and and you know basically just measure things, right? And let's say the function that I want to evaluate is whether there is light or not. Okay. So if I do this, I'm probably going to get a whole bunch of measurements that are going to be in the order of maybe 110 volts. 115. Then if I'm in the second row, I'm going to get a whole bunch of zeros because I don't get any voltage because the electricity there is broken. Maybe 108, 120. Basically, I'll get some numbers of this kind. Now, if I just go and average over this, namely whether there's light or not, well, if I take the average of this, then I'm going to get something like probably 80 or 90 volts. 
and maybe my incandescent light bulb will probably still produce some light, and if I have this one, it's going to be entirely dark, right? Because it's a CFL light, and it will just not work with lower voltage. So in other words, the, bright, the estimated brightness of the room at the mean of the voltage is going to be zero, for instance, here, right, with a CFL light. Whereas if I actually go and plug the CFL light into each of those sockets and then look at the average, I'll find out that in 80% of all cases there's actually light in the room. So that should give you some intuition why taking the mode or looking at the mean or then actually going and, well, computing the mean and then evaluating a function thereof can mean very, very different things. And only in some cases when you get particularly lucky, like here, are those approximations actually kosher. Right? So mode as an estimation of the mean. So the estimating the mode to avoid solving the integral is something that's perfectly reasonable, for instance, in a Gaussian process. Because usually you engineer loss functions to be convex. So, every, so basically, whenever you have convexity or, let's say, log concavity of the posterior, everything is good. When you don't have that, things can get rather unpleasant. Um, so going back to deep networks for a moment, this is one of the reasons why you can actually end up with the same model and two different implementations, and one of them works and the other one doesn't, because it just so happens that one optimization algorithm will give you a much worse mode than the other. Welcome to that part of the world. Yeah? So the fact that the mode is close to the mean, does it have to do with also this, the symmetry of the distribution we get? Um, so in this case, um, well, I just drew it such that it's symmetric, but you can have perfectly asymmetric distributions where the mode and the mean are the same. So. Let's construct such a case, right? Uh, okay, let's just pick one major mode here. I'm, I'm just going to pick something that's multimodal, but you can probably play with it otherwise. Okay, so here's the mode that we care about. And then I'll pick something that has a small bump here. And maybe I pick something that has a larger bump there, closer by. So this will have mean and mode coinciding, and it's a very much asymmetric distribution. So let's say we have a weight of 0.7 here, weight of 0.1 here, weight of 0.2 here, right? And this is just, you know, let's say maybe at 1, here it's at 0, and here it's at 3. And if you do that, you will very neatly get the mean of 1, and it's asymmetric. Um, in general, the posteriors will be asymmetric. However, a lot of priors will be symmetric. So you're on, on the right track here. Uh, as a matter of fact, symmetry is a really good guiding principle when you engineer priors if you don't have any specific prior knowledge of what the solution should be. You could say, well, at least it should be symmetric in under certain changes on my, de on my distribution. On the other hand, if you actually have good knowledge of how my distribution should look like, for instance, I should expect to see only a small number of non-zeros and so on, then you can do further engineering on that. Right. Okay. So I hope that solves your question a little bit. But thanks for asking. Yes? Um, for the integral, it does. For the optimization, it's irrelevant. And this is another reason why mode finding is so much more popular. So almost all algorithms that deal with Gaussian process classification and related things will try to do mode finding. In some cases, what they do is they actually do a hybrid strategy of mode finding and integration. So what they'll do is they will make use of what's called the Laplace approximation.
So let's say we have some P of it, P of data, given the data. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to write this as, well, minus log P of data, given the data, is minus log P of theta star, given the data, plus, and then here we have a just a Taylor approximation. So theta star is supposed to be the mode, so the first derivative vanishes. And then we have basically plus one half theta minus theta star d squared of log p of theta times theta minus theta star plus some other terms. Right. Now if you squint at that hard enough, this looks very much like a normal distribution. Okay, here's a constant, here's some other stuff, the linear term disappears. So in other words, what I've just done is I've made a quadratic expansion around the posterior. And so what I can do is I can basically therefore assume that theta is drawn from a normal distribution at mean theta star and with covariance, well, basically d squared of minus log p of theta given data, that entire thing inverse. Why inverse? Because, well, this is basically the inverse covariance up here. So, this is just a fancy name for Taylor expansion. But of course, if you want to sound fancy, you will use Laplace approximation and then you can intimidate the people who you're talking to, right? And sometimes people do that when they write papers. Okay, also because everybody knows what exactly you're expanding. But that's all it is. Okay, um, does that help a little bit? Good. Uh, now let's move on with Gaussian process classification. Okay. So this is basically, you know, what I was going on before, so that integrating out over the latent variables is really expensive, so what you can do is you basically do mode finding, and then you basically, you know, do something like you find t prime, given argmax of p of t hat and t prime, or you could actually, you know, then just estimate y given x using logistic. So that's exactly what I was talking about before. So, what it really means is you go and solve this optimization problem, which is now nice and convex. And what you go is you then find t prime given t, because we still know that t prime given t is drawn from a normal distribution, right? This is exactly as we would do it before. And then you just estimate p of y given t prime. Or rather, you do that for the mode of it. You don't even integrate that out either. So there's a whole bunch of approximations in there. This is fairly straightforward and it works really well. So here's what happens on clean data. And what I've done is I've drawn um, those lines of you know, probability here, which I think correspond to, I think, you know, 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, so this is something similar to a margin, except that, well, now it's not explicitly defined as a margin anymore. So you can see that, well, this region here is more bluish than this one there, right? And right, likewise, this one is more magenta-ish than this one here. So you can clearly see that, 
you know, it takes into account where the data sits. And if you squint hard, you'll see the data. For noisy data, it still gets it fairly right. And you can see that it deals very gracefully with, you know, these outliers. Okay. And now connecting this up back to an SVM. If you look at it in an SVM, we minimized one half alpha transpose k alpha plus this very weird loss function. This was the soft margin loss function. Recall that's the, this one here. Right. And for logistic regression, we have something similar. We have basically this green function as our loss. And now all we have to do is we just reparameterize alpha equals k inverse t. And you get basically something that looks very similar to what we had before. So those two loss functions here are very similar. Right? And so actually SVMs in Gaussian process classifications don't do something very different. They are just derived in very, very different ways. But it's not very surprising that they work almost equally well just because of that. And so if you squint really hard, you can see all those loss functions doing very similar things. So the blue one is our logistic loss function. Right? And if you look at it, you can see that for f of x being very positive, this will converge to 0. Because this will converge to log of 1, right? And for f of x being very negative, this will be essentially converging to f of x. It's basically a linear function. Now, in a soft margin scenario, we have the same situation. We basically have linear and constant 0. The only difference is how they treat this region around here, and also the fact that with an SVM, you have this offset y1 to the right. And there's something else that actually works fairly well that people have found empirically. And there isn't an amazing amount of summary on that. But for instance, if you're using VW, so Valpol Wobbit, um, so that uses what can only be described as a Huberized loss. So remember Huber's robust loss for regression? It basically uses the same idea, but now just for classification. So this function is constant 0 for 1 and larger. It is quadratic for, well, basically 0 and larger. It's, it's, it's linear for 0 and, and smaller. And it's quadratic in here. So it's somewhat a hybrid between the soft margin and the logistic. It's you know, continuously differentiable. Uh, empirically, John Langford found that this works ever so slightly better than a logistic and a soft margin. Um, I don't think anybody has a really good theoretical handle of why that is the case. But if you're hunting for the very best of loss functions, uh, this one should definitely be in your list of loss functions to use. Right. It's not going to make a huge difference, but it might give you a fraction of a percent. Any questions? Because with that, we conclude Gaussian process classification. Yep? Which one? The green one? Uh, which, which function? The light blue one. Oh, sorry. OK, sorry, I forgot to mention this. This is basically the actual misclassification loss. So in other words, if you get the sign wrong, you incur an error of, of 1. Otherwise, you incur no error. And what you can see is that this green function is essentially the tightest piecewise linear function, piecewise linear convex function that upper bounds this. Um, these other functions can also be made to upper bound this by just suitable rescaling. Right. 
because that's another way of motivating some of those loss functions by saying, well, we cannot really optimize over zero one loss, but we could optimize over this. So let's actually pick something that's piecewise linear or logistic or something of that form. Okay. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Okay. Who thinks they could now go and implement a Gaussian process classifier? Hmm. Okay. Maybe we need to practice that in the homework. Uh, no, but seriously, guys, it's not a lot of lines of code. It's basically just a convex solver on the objective function that I showed you. Right? So this is, if you're using an off-the-shelf solver, it's probably about five lines of code. Um, the derivation, well, taking a derivative of a quadratic function is kind of not so hard. Taking how, how you arrive at, that's what we went through in class. So I strongly recommend that you go through this in more detail if something is not quite so clear there, because this is quite important stuff. OK, good. So that concludes Gaussian processes. And yeah, there's a lot of references that I'm yeah, going to put up online. So now we'll get to graphical models. So this is a complete change of gears. And we'll, amongst other things, figure out what, whether who came first, the chicken or the egg, or why this is a really stupid question to ask. Um, let's start with something else, right? So brain and brawn, right? So let's say maybe brains are less common than brawn. And so maybe chances of somebody being smart is 10% and something, somebody being strong is 20%, right? And well, if you're really strong, then, well, you know, you can get one of those academic fellowships for your university and they'll graduate you for throwing balls, right? So chances of you graduating if you're really brawny are maybe 0.8. Chances of graduating if you're really smart maybe are also only 0.8. If you have neither, well, okay, you have to pay a lot for ghostwriters. If you're good at both, well, okay, it, it helps, but you know it's not going to help a lot more than that. Right. Okay. All the numbers are purely fictitious, and yeah, whatever. Don't sue me for that. Right. But um, so the idea is basically, you know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a very very simple graphical model, and the graphical model is basically going to be this one here, where we have two unobserved variables, brain and brawn, which lead to an observed outcome, namely graduation or not graduation. So this is usually drawn shaded. Right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to infer based on this observation and maybe then occasionally if we observe any of these other two variables, what the other one respectively is. And I'll walk you through that in this very simple example first. And then we'll go to the formalisms behind it. If you already know things like explaining away, then you can probably really relax now. Who's heard of explaining away before? OK, awesome. One or two people. Um, OK, sorry. Let's go back one more time. So what we can do is we can actually go and write the joint probability distribution with regard to graduation, sports, and brain. And so P of G, S, and B as just P of G given S and B, because it depends on you know, graduation and brain, times P of S times P of B. And so I'm assuming here that 
the talents are distributed independently. So I'm assuming that, you know, whether you're brainy doesn't tell me anything about whether you're strong and vice versa. Um, now let's see what happens. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can just look at the joint distribution of, you know, somebody being strong and somebody being brainy, right? And so I just go and multiply numbers. So chances of somebody having none of those redeeming qualities is, you know, 72%. And then, you know, we get 8 and 18% and 2% for those really highly gifted people, right? That's this box here. And remember that we assumed that the chances of somebody graduating, given those attributes, are these numbers. Now what we have to do in order to get the joint distribution is we need to actually pointwise multiply those guys, right? This is, what we, this is that term, and that's this term here. So what happens? Okay, so if we elementwise multiply this, we just get a whole bunch of small numbers, but what do they actually mean? They are basically the chances of somebody graduating given all those conditions. Right? So that's just, you know, those are just the odds. And there's actually a substantial number of people, if you think about it, who graduate without any redeeming qualities, right? It completely outweighs these two. The first one is for people who are very smart. And the second one is for people who are very smart and very strong. The only ones that really outweigh it overall are those graduating from sports. Why? Because the number of occurrences for sports was twice as high, high as those for brain. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition on the graduation. So we first had the joint distribution over sports, brain, and graduation. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set aside only those people who actually graduated. So I'm going to condition on G, namely more specifically on G equals 1. So now what I have to do is I have need all those numbers here to sum up to 1 again, which is basically what Bayes' rule does, right? P of sports and brain given graduation is the joint distribution divided by now summing over S prime and B prime, you know, for that specific value of graduation. So the denominator is just the sum of those four squares. And what we get is something that first of all now sums up to 1. Right? And now we can see that you know, condition on the graduation, you know, about 24% of people have no redeeming abilities. About 21% were actually smart. Half of them were quite strong, and 6% were strong and smart. Okay. So this is very, very simple, just base rule. You can you know, do that with your bare hands, so to say. Um, as a matter of fact, we could have put that into the exam, and it would not have been a hard question. But now let's actually go and ask a few other questions. What are the chances of somebody being smart if he graduated? Well, so what I have to do is I have to sum. Right? All those numbers sum up to 1. And what I can do is I can, you know, okay, so something is a little bit off here because those things don't sum up to 1, so something is wrong here. But what I can do is I can ask questions like, well, P of brain, given that he graduated and he's sporty, right? 
So what I'm now doing is I'm basically just focusing in on this row here. And so now I need this number to sum up to 1, right? Because I'm now conditioning on the graduation and on this person being athletic. Right? And so now, well, 0 0.6, 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.06 plus 0 0.483 is about 11%. So in other words, your default guess of somebody being smart, given that he graduated and he's sporty, are very, are very low. And furthermore, if he graduated, given that he isn't sporty, right, that, that chance is fairly high. So now all of a sudden, conditioned on those things, condition on the graduation as well, sports and, and being good at academic things are actually correlated to each other. So remember we started out with assuming that being strong and being smart were independent of each other. Conditioned on an observation that is affected by both of those attributes, knowing one tells me something about the other. Right? And likewise, if, if I know whether somebody's smart or not smart, tells me something about how sporty he is. So in other words, if somebody graduated and you know he's smart, then, well, maybe it's not so likely that he's sporty. On the other hand, if he graduated and he's stupid, then, well, maybe he's really strong. So those are exactly those four numbers here. Um, if this is a bit overwhelming, um, I strongly recommend that you go through those slides in detail at home. Because it's really just application of base rule. Uh, any more questions so far? Yes? Is that wrong or is it just a thing you crossed out? Or do you also it's wrong, yes. Okay, so what I... OK, let, we can actually work out those numbers directly, right? So P of graduation, so we already have that table here. Now, P of brains given graduation, well, is basically nothing else than we need to, you know, we need to sum over the sporty and the non-sporty parts. So this is brains. And so we need to sum over those two numbers versus those two numbers plus these two numbers. Right. So we have, therefore, 0 0.215 plus 0 0.06 divided by that plus and then we have the rest here. Well, no, actually, so the, 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 sorry, the numbers are correct because the denominator is 1. OK, so I apologize, this is actually correct. Because P of brain is really just the sum of this 0.215 plus 0 0.006 is 0.275. Likewise, P of sports, given that he graduated, is just the sum over these two numbers in the green box, right? So I apologize, this is actually correct. Okay. Now, what basically happened is we first assumed that, you know, we had this very simple well, graphical model, right? So what, what you could also do is you could, you know, turn things around and you could say, well, you know, maybe being smart causes you to be strong 
uh, to graduate cause you to be maybe athletic and maybe also very studious because those are maybe two things that you learn at university, right? So you could write a model like this. So let's assume that you know graduation is maybe an independent random variable. And then being strong and brainy are maybe caused by you know, graduation. So again, you can get similar things. So, and so it's, so you know, we've, we're modeling a distribution over the same sets of random variables. The only thing is that now what I've done is I've just reversed the errors. And this gives me immediately a very different graphical model. And, yep? Before we assume that uh, in general being uh, uh, smart and, and having uh, uh, and being strong were independent. Correct. Now, we assume they conditionally. now I'm assuming that they are conditionally independent, conditioned on the graduation. So it's an assumption. Because yes, that. exactly. So all of those are modeling assumptions. Now, the obvious question is well, you know, what do you do if somebody gives you, well, here's some data come up with a smart model. And there is a fairly large branch of statistics which does nothing else but essentially infer the arcs in graphical models. CMU actually has a fantastic department of that. It's called the Department of Philosophy. So the philosophers at CMU do math and graphical models and statistics. You should say hi to them at some point. They have some very fantastic people there. Right? Um, yeah, I was first kind of perplexed when I found out about that because it's not the thing that usually philosophers do, but actually they would ask questions of causality. Because this, this model here where we just reverted the arcs, right, is a really important one because, for instance, you can, you can ask, you know, does going to university make you smart? Or is it the case that you will get, that only smart people go to university, right? And by being able to answer that question, you can then figure out what you should do. Because, I mean, in one case, well, building more universities doesn't really help, right? Because people are going to stay dumb. So no point. You're smart before. You will be smart afterwards. Why should you study? On the other hand, if it actually is the case that studying makes you smart, then you should send everybody to university. So this has fairly immediate policy implications it has implications like, uh, so for instance, let's take smoking. So let's assume that I can get lung cancer based on smoking and based on maybe working in a coal mine. And there it has a very immediate implication whether, you know, those two things cause smoke, smoking or whether people who are susceptible to smoking uh, to cancer, really enjoy smoking and whether they really like to work in coal mines. And maybe for a decade or so, people were essentially arguing that. The other thing is that causality does not mean probability one. Right? So if I throw this pen at you, well, I might miss, I might hit you. Well, if I hit you, you'll still be upset and you will say, well, look, you know, you hurt me and uh, you'll be really mad at me. Because this was a causal relationship. Even though chances of me hitting you are probably not one. It might be very low if I'm a really bad shot, right? Uh, so therefore, causation is not probability one. Furthermore, correlation and causation are, of course, also two different things. And I guess we all have seen the XKCD cartoon on that. If you haven't searched for that, correlation, causation, XKCD. You'll enjoy it. OK, now let's move on. Um, so, OK, I mean, the same thing. And so it happens here as well, and just going to formalize it a little bit more. So maybe we have, you know, some web service. And so let's say you want to find out whether my website's up. 
and maybe I use MySQL and I use Apache. Okay, well, by now I should be writing MariaDB rather than MySQL, but it's a different story. Um, and so I can basically, if the site is down, I can try debugging things, right? And so what I could do is I could first check whether maybe, you know, the, uh, the Apache server is not working. And if that's not working, then there's a pretty good chance that I found the problem because well, it's not so likely that both things break at the same time. But what I've effectively done through that is I have, now what happens is that now all of a sudden, you know, MySQL and Apache become dependent variables on each other. They're not independent anymore. They don't factorize anymore just by normalizing. Right? And so you get the obvious thing where, you know, if it's work, furthermore, if it's working, in this case, I can immediately infer that, you know, both of the producing services for that are working. And if it's broken, I know that at least of them is broken. Now, why would you actually do this, right? I mean, after all, we're just talking about three binary random variables. Why would you not just go and estimate the full joint distribution? Okay. It's much easier to estimate. And, well, you can actually model things in quite interesting, simple ways. So if you think about, you know, the full distribution for, you know, those four random variables, so I have maybe MySQL, Apache, the web server, and then a the user action. So if I wanted to model all of that directly, um, then I would need 15 parameters. Why would I need 15 parameters? Well, because I have 16 possible states and they all need to sum to one, so I can cheat by one. Now, if I have this factorizing distribution as I wrote it out here, I need one parameter here. I need another one there. I need another one there. And then I have four possible states here. So I need four. So in other words, I need seven numbers as opposed to 15. That doesn't look like a huge improvement, right? Can you explain why you need four? Why, OK, so why do I need four numbers to model W? Well, I'm assuming that W, the website, will depend on M and A on its possible values. Now, M and A can have, can take on four different configurations. Is it conditional? Yeah, it's a conditional probability. So P of W given M and A. M and A are binary variables. Each of those can, you know, take on its own values independently. So I have four possible configurations. For each of those, I need to write out the probability of W being one. So that's why I get four numbers. So altogether, I have seven. And of course, this means that I'm assuming a very specific causal relationship of all those variables. This causal relationship is extremely useful for me to debug stuff. Because if I never have access to the website directly, but only to the user action, then I can still use that as a debug signal to find out whether, let's say, my server is up. OK. Now, if I have larger graphical models, then this will actually make a big difference. Now, the other thing is I'm not really allowed to have loops in this language where I'm expressing things. So I can ask, you know, who came first, the chicken or the egg? Or, you know, did the chicken come from the egg? Then, and if I do that, I get horrible statistical expressions. And the reason why this is really bad is because you get stuff like this you will get p of chicken given egg times p of egg given chicken. Right? That is stupid. What you can do is you can ask, you know, p of chicken given the egg times p of the egg, or p of egg given the chicken times p of chicken. OK. Um, this red equation looks utterly stupid. It is utterly stupid. And I remember once spending an hour 
with a team of people who presumably had a PhD in a company somewhere in Silicon Valley trying to explain to them this, that this was stupid. Okay. No, we didn't talk about chickens and eggs, but this was actually about some user actions and some other things being observed from it. But they effectively added a loop into a larger graphical model, and they said, well, look, we implemented it. It works, so therefore it must be right. Well, they did something, but it wasn't actually probabilistic inference anymore. Okay. Morale of the story there is you can actually end up with models that make absolutely no statistical sense and that still do something moderately useful in one of the cases, but you're losing a lot of safeguards. So you may not necessarily want to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, let's look at how you really should be doing things. So this is a directed graphical model. It looks a little bit more scary than the ones before, but it's still the same thing. So you have some probability distribution. So each circle corresponds to a random variable. So like website working, or brain, or brawn, or a user maybe clicking on an ad, or whatever. And what I'm assuming is that each variable, each probability distribution, depends on its parents, and the parents are those with incoming R, basically with the Rx incoming. So in other words, for variable number five, I would have parents, okay, so for variable number five, I would have these parents. Those parents, in their own right, may depend on something else, but that's a different story. So <clears throat> the point is that if I have this, I can write the entire joint probability distribution as just P of random variable given their parents. And since I have a directed acyclic graph, I can never get those loops. So in other words, there's always a total order that I can impose on those vertices such that if I traverse things in this total order, nothing ever will depend on stuff that happens later. If you think about it, that's effectively how you, for instance, want to design a class. You w don't want to have forward references to content that you haven't covered yet. Likewise, if you write a computer program and you have a dependence on something that you're going to define later, you need to do all sorts of awkward things to make this problem go away, right? And if you have circularly built dependencies, then um, life's hell, right? So you don't want to have circular built dependencies. Same thing here in graphical models. Yep? So uh, if you consider that you have, let's say, uh, 8 uh, depends on 5. Yes. 5 depends on 2, then 8 depends on 2, right? Um, in this case, yes. But you may have a lot of other less obvious chains. And so looking at this overall dependence structure is actually something that we're going to do. So you're asking a really, really good question. Can I establish sets of dependencies between different random variables. For instance, is it the case that if I observe five, that then eight and two are independent of each other, right? Or can it actually be that maybe by observing five, now nine and one might actually become dependent on each other, right? No, so Plain dependence, yeah, that's, well, most things here depend on each other, yes. But the, the bigger issue is that I want to actually, and plain dependence is just if you condition on nothing, right? Yeah, so I'm just saying if there's a path between two nodes. Well, stay tuned for that. It's a little bit more complex than that. And there's basically one set of rules that guide things for directed graphs. And there's one set of rules that give you this for undirected graphical models. In undirected graphical models, it's really just simply graph connectivity. We'll get to that probably at the end of next week. Um, for directed graphs, it's actually a little bit more tricky because of the things that we encountered before, namely the explaining away. Where if I have things that are dependent on each other, so for instance, if I 
because they have a common parent, then observing the parent all of a sudden makes them independent of each other, conditioned on the parent. Likewise, if two variables have a common outcome, then observing the outcome all of a sudden makes them dependent on each other even though initially they were independent. So, it's, so the simplest case of that common outcome is, let's say, two cars crash into each other. The cars were independent before, but conditioned on the outcome, I know that both cars have to, be, have, to have been driving at that spot. Okay. So let's look a little bit on how, what we can actually do. The formal expression for what I just did before is that, well, p of x is just p of xi given its parents. You could write out some, you could add some additional variables in here, but it wouldn't do you any good because it doesn't really directly depend on them. And you can see that this, of course, can often be much easier to parameterize than, you know, just a full model. And the good thing is that the log likelihood decomposes very cleanly. So you can basically estimate each of those things independently and then just piece stuff together. So for instance, if you think about it, well, let's model the chances of the light being on if the switch is on or off. And you can perform a very detailed analysis and you'll find out that in 99% of all cases, the light will go on if the switch is switched on. Then you can go and ask me to maybe throw a dart at the light switch and you'll find out that maybe I'm, I managed to hit it in one, of the, one out of 50 cases, right? Because I'm a really bad shot at that, right? So then you can ask the question, you know, what are the chances of the light going on if Alex throws a dart? Well, that's basically 0 0.02, because I'm really lousy at that, times 0.99. And you can now predict the outcome of a more complex system while having measured and estimated only each of those components separately. It's kind of nice. Now, the other thing is, if x is not fully observed, that's basically when you have to design a lot of really nice algorithms. And that's pretty much going to be the main point of this graphical models uh, segment. Okay. Um, yep. So the brief summary of you know, what we did so far is we spelled out graphical models in their most basic form. We looked at explaining a way, namely independent variables become dependent and vice versa, and that you really must not add loops. So please never, never, never design something like this. Do not. Please don't. Uh, does somebody know how to fix that graphical model and still have that causal relationship? Because, well, we know that chickens lay eggs and eggs are where chickens hatch from. Yes? You add a third variable that uh, influences both? You're very much on the right track. So what's that third variable? Time. Time, yes. OK. Or more specifically, the chicken and egg iteration counter. In other words, the chicken, do the chicken doesn't lay its own egg. Right? The chicken lies, lays, the, the hen lays its, its, child, its daughter's egg, right? And then, you know, that's where the next chicken generation comes from. So, therefore, that entire question of who came first, the chicken and the egg, is a stupid one because it is not, because what basically happened is whoever asked that question collapsed out the counter of the variable that you need to refer to. So what you really have is you have chicken, egg, and then you have a new chicken and a new egg, and then you have the next chicken and the next egg. So what you do is you basically would have a counter C1, E1, C2, E2, C3, E3. Wow. And so, 
if we do this, we have you know, a perfect linear chain that solves that problem for good. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So what you so what you're describing is so p time pressure times volume times temperature equals constant, right? And uh, no, sorry, no, PV over T equals constant. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, now what? Okay. So first of all, what happens actually at the micro level is. Well, you know, you're talking about a gas which contains atoms or molecules, and they really bump into each other. So at a micro level, all that nice causality relation is still satisfied. And if you can go and read up a lot of wonderful literature on thermodynamics of, you know, how that all fits together. Okay. Now, on a macro level, what you've described is you basically have a constraint on the number of variables that need to satisfy a condition. And that's basically just saying, well, unless they satisfy those conditions, uh, that product doesn't occur. So you might, for instance, be able to encode this as T as a function of P and V, which is now a deterministic mapping. There's nothing to prevent me from having a deterministic mapping. As a matter of fact, before with my website, I had that. It was basically that the site is down if one of the two services are broken, and it's up if you know, they work. So we had exactly that deterministic mapping for something that wasn't a physical phenomenon. So but the problem is that the atoms were each way. So well, okay. Uh, okay, so what you're getting into is you're now going to manipulate those variables. And what you're going to say is, well, if I manipulate one, then it affects the other. So now you're basically applying causes to some of them. And if you do that, then you will actually need to worry about the causal relationships between them. So you then need to put that into the larger system that, where things affect each other. And it's unlikely that you will be able to independently affect pressure, temperature, and volume. Because if you could do that, um, you would just have broken that natural law, right? So you can only always affect two of them to get the third one. Well, actually, you can change it by just changing the number of particles, but we're getting into physics here. OK. Um, there was one last question, then we actually need to wrap up for today. Is, is there a way to express the process of the chicken and the process of an egg as a single variable? Or does it really matter how the variables are defined? OK, I'm not sure what the process of a chicken is. Um, so what I what you probably mean is the fact that you know this chicken runs around at some point it lays eggs and so on so you would then you could go and you know elaborate on that chicken model in more detail and you'd get more random variables and maybe you can model whether it has breakfast and you know whether the farmer disturbs it after that so there's you can go into more details and sometimes you then actually design components so for instance if you had a chicken coop right then it would be supremely awkward to model each chicken separately as a random variable and write it out, because you'd basically end up drawing the chicken coop. Thanks goodness, uh, statisticians have a really nice way of drawing those chicken coops. So what we'll get is basically ci, which is my random variable. And then they add the statistics equivalent of a for loop, i, which just means now I have this is called a plate. So though if you can't quite see it on, on the slide, it's basically just you put a, a box around it with a variable that indicates what you iterate over. If you then wanted to maybe model that the chicken lays eggs, okay, so here we have the eggs, then you would have to make that plate larger. But then maybe all those eggs go into a box. And now this box depends on all the eggs that are being laid. And then, depending on you know, how many eggs you find in the box, you can make inference about the distribution of chicken and how fertile they are. Okay, 
But we're going into a lot of details here, and I'm getting kicked out in a moment now. So think of chickens, eggs, and plates, and chicken farms if you want. We'll do a lot more about dependence on Wednesday. Yeah, coffee is addictive. Okay. Um, would you please stop the camera?